the higher I've climbed in my career, the more challenged I've been by people's perceptions of me as a Black woman leader. Most of the white folks that I may interact with professionally have never had a Black boss. Your best advice about dreaming fearlessly. Whatever your highest aspiration is, it's probably too low. Multiply it by 10 and see where that takes you. Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. Welcome to the Carlos Watson Show. We've got a special one coming up for you today. We shine the Discover Spotlight on the former lead singer of The Urge. He now is slinging some killer hot dogs out of St. Louis, Missouri. Of course, I'm talking about Steve Ewing of Steve's Hot Dogs. You'll meet him in just a bit. But first, maybe one of the most interesting educators in the world, a wonderful woman, Dr. Danielle Moss, started her life off as a reluctant teacher and has become a very special thinker and person when it comes to teaching, education, race, and change. You're gonna love it. Dr. Danielle Moss, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. At a time in which we're finally talking about fairness and equity in a real and candid way, few voices may be more important than that of Dr. Danielle Moss. A former teacher in the Bronx and Brooklyn, she's now the CEO of one of the most innovative education organizations anywhere in the world. All of her scholars helps Black and Latinx students make their way through top independent schools and ultimately into prestigious colleges. She's been hailed as one of the most important players in public education by the Daily News and placed on the Commission for Gender Equality by Mayor de Blasio. What would have surprised young you the most? Like that young woman who just got tabbed as an assistant principal. If you were to go back and be able to tell her two or three things, what would be two or three of the first things you would tell her if you were trying to give her the real real? I definitely would have told my younger self Stay as long as you can, but when you're done, it's okay to be done. You don't have to stay in spaces where you're not valued to prove anything to anyone. Um, and you can create your own lane. You know, I think that I understood that there is racism and I certainly understood that there would be barriers, but I still had a sense of limitless possibilities that I feel Interestingly enough, the higher I've climbed in my career, the more challenged I've been by people's perceptions of me as a Black woman leader. Most of the white folks that I may interact with professionally have never had a Black boss, have never had their ability to feed their families be tied to what a Black person thinks of their work product. But I, I, I can't tell you the number of Black nonprofit CEOs who will tell you how often their white subordinates feel perfectly comfortable going over their heads if they don't like a decision that's made. And how often those white higher-ups will entertain that kind of challenge to leadership um, and not see anything wrong with it. I, I know what it's like to be undervalued, to be not respected in your workplace. Um, to have your contributions be diminished. Um, and I think I always felt like my intellectual capital was gonna be a calling card that could help me to overcome some of that. Um, and sometimes that's not enough, quite frankly. Sometimes you can be the smartest person in the room and still not get the opportunities. Um, but so I would tell my younger self, um, that that's real. I stopped asking kids, hey, do you wanna to go to college? I started asking them, what college would you like to attend? The way we value schools is based on what they can do for the lowest performing students, right? We don't really invest resources in the kids who actually are just like in the middle. There's so many kids with tremendous potential. If you're not, if someone doesn't grab you and f help you focus and redirect you, um, you can get lost. If you're for equity, you're all in. I want exactly for my kids the same things I would want for my own children. It doesn't look different. It doesn't look like less than. Um, people who start out with less than don't need less than solutions. If anything, they need more to accommodate for all of the privilege they don't have access to. As you said, you never know who's watching. You never know who's looking. And somebody were to say, Dr. Moss, come on in. 
me, President Donald Trump. You know, I have to say that I probably would not accept that invitation. You know, um, I don't think, I, I wouldn't want the responsibility or the burden of trying to educate someone who is so immune to the experiences of others. You know, um, every professional role that I've had, I think about it in the context of how will this serve black and brown people who look like me. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. And, and where were you growing up with your mom? Were you guys in New York proper? Born and raised, I like to say, on the, on the main streets of the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, <laughs> I, my mother uh, is a librarian by training, and so she worked at Rutgers for um, a few years. Um, her family hails from Barbados, and so I also spent some of my elementary years uh, in Barbados. And were, were you an only child, or do you have brothers and sisters? I am an only child. Oh, interesting. And were you a, a, a spoiled, uh, uh, deeply loved uh, only child, or challenged, or? Deeply loved, definitely not spoiled. I think my mother is of the cut from that stoic Caribbean cloth. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would not say that I was spoiled. But, you know, one thing I have to say is that, you know, my mother, obviously, she wasn't wealthy. You know, all of her disposable income and resources, you know, as I look back, were really invested in making sure that I had certain experiences, you know, whether it was clarinet lessons or music lessons or science classes at the Museum of Natural History. I just feel like New York was a great place to grow up, to be, um, you know, the, the Upper West Side, particularly at that time, was an incredibly diverse neighborhood. Um, and, um, you know, we got to just wander and explore and be fully who we were. And I think that's been invaluable for me. Your best advice about dreaming fearlessly. You know a lot of people want to dream fearlessly but are either scared or they start and it's hard or they're not sure how to do it. What's the best advice you give people or maybe you've received yourself about dreaming fearlessly? I heard Hill Harper say this at a conference and it always stuck with me. Whatever your highest aspiration is, it's probably too low. Multiply it by 10 and see where that takes you. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I, I, I think we, I think the older you get, the more realistic your dreams become. And you really got to push yourself to just leap into spaces where you don't belong. Apply for the job you're not qualified for, you know. Go for it. Ask for the date with the person you think is going to say no. You have no idea what's on the other end of your courage. And so what made you choose this work, given that, that, that it feels like you had a mother who was, who was thoughtful and empowering? Uh, was it obvious that you were going to go into education and, and, and higher ed in particular? Or, or what made you choose the work? Yeah, no, it definitely was not odd, obvious. Um, I really had aspirations to become a college professor, which is different, but not completely unrelated. Um, but I took a teaching job in the Bronx after college and after a very brief stint at Smith Barney, where my cousin worked. Um, and I knew right away that finance was not going to be my calling. Uh, so my mother convinced me to try teaching out while I you know, figured out what I wanted to do next. And um, I had a great group of kids. I had a wonderful principal. I got promoted at a very young age to assistant principal. And yeah, I was off and running. Interesting. And, and why did the promotion come about? What, what was it that you think led to it? So it was so interesting because um, the assistant principal just stopped coming to work one day. 
um, and there was work that had to be done and I was young and I didn't have a lot of home responsibilities. So I was happy to come in early and stay late and just pitch in. And one day the principal said, you know, I know you don't have as much teaching experience as some of the other teachers in the, in the building, um, but we worked really well together. And so she took this chance on me um, and it completely informed my professional trajectory. Wait, so literally, this is this in principle, like literally just like, peace, I'm out, like just didn't come anymore or, or resign? I mean, literally never saw her again. Um, I mean, we tried to send her her last paycheck and she didn't even, it came back, you know, returned to send her. So I never found out what the story was, but um, it opened up an opportunity for me that, that have completely informed how I spent, you know, my career. So wh wherever you are, I guess, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's probably like some crazy Dateline special. That that is crazy that that someone just stopped showing up uh, uh, like that. But so so you so you must have also not only had someone believe in you, but you must have been really good at it probably early on. Or did it take you a while to get into the groove of administrator, which I assume is different than than teacher? You know, I think that the thing that has carried me through professionally is you know, this just kind of drive to learn and want to know and want to be better and want to be the best. Um, I think that was the thing that the principal saw in me. Um, and I remember when I was leaving that job, one of the teachers pulled me aside and she said, you know, when uh, the principal made this decision to promote you, I told her she was making the biggest mistake of her career. And she was like, you have supported me and challenged me and, uh, you know, opened me up to new ways of thinking and new ways of teaching. And I wanted you to know, A, that I said that, and B, that I'm owning that I was wrong. What's your favorite book? Beloved by Toni Morrison. Favorite TV show? So I didn't grow up with a lot of television because my mother was a librarian. Um, so my favorite show right now is, it's a toss between Power on Stars, because I think Courtney Kemp is a genius, um, and Midsummer Murders on PBS. That's a nice combo. Uh, if you could have dinner with absolutely anybody, uh, dead or alive, who would, you, who would you love to have dinner with? Oprah. Oprah, the queen. Okay. Oprah, every time. My, my dream is to write a book that gets me on uh, Super Soul Sunday. Your karaoke song. I Would Die For You, Prince. Most interesting thing you've ever learned about love. It's forever. Love is forever. Uh, Danielle, I am so grateful to you. Thank and thank you, you. So much, Carlo. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Danielle Moss. I appreciate how thoughtful she was. I appreciate her bravery. I appreciate the fact that even in the world of philanthropy where there needs to be improvement, but maybe not everyone always sees it, that she's been bold and insistent on a better way and better change. I love what she said about Ireland. That inspired me too. I got the same kind of shivers that she talked about. And of course, I love her mom because her mom reminded me of my mom. That idea of bringing good books and good learning uh, to your little one. I just love everything about that. Um, we're now gonna turn to a different story, but also a wonderful story. It's part of a wonderful thing that we do called Brighter Financial Friday, sponsored by our good friends at Discover. Now, of course, COVID sadly hit a lot of people in devastating ways. Black-owned restaurants, as many of you know, some 41% of them closed, another 17% of white-owned restaurants. It's clearly been difficult, and so Discover did something wonderful and brilliant. They encouraged people all across the U.S. to nominate local Black-owned restaurants for the chance to win $25,000 from Discover to help support their restaurant. Now, overall, Discover's Eat It Forward campaign has given $5 million to Black-owned restaurants all across the country. Absolutely love it. Right now, I want to introduce you to one of those winners an amazing guy, St. Louis, Missouri, the man behind maybe some of the best hot dogs you're ever going to eat. Of course, Steve's Hot Dogs. And of course, I'm talking about Steve Ewing. I'm Steve Ewing, and this is Steve's Hot Dogs. Long before Steve's Hot Dogs, 
Steve Ewing was a big deal. He was a long-haired music wild child, the front man of the ska metal band known as The Urge. Jump right in. I've been doing for the past 30 years. Steve nearly hit the big time, but never quite had the mainstream success of the next Lenny Kravitz or Chris Robinson. And so, like many artists, he had to find a new way to pay the bills. Um, I was in LA and I was kind of like coming up with these ideas to do food. Steve had always enjoyed hot dogs, and as his pockets got low, he began to think about hot dogs as not just food, but maybe bread. <laughs> We began uh, this restaurant about 11 years ago. So we had a hot dog cart. And over time, what started as a hot dog stand quickly became a restaurant. But when COVID hit early this year, Steve felt once again that his dreams might get crushed. So 2020 is a very, this, this year is crazy. COVID, COVID comes and it's like madness. You know, everything is shut down. Yeah, I was nervous. I, I was pretty broken down. Although Steve was suffering, he was worried even more about others. Kids were out of school, and some kids don't get food when they're not in school. Steve knew he had to do something. So we're like, let's, let's see how we can do this, how we can stay open, and, and not only just serve the food, but how can we also get back to the community right now? That's when something special gave him a glimmer of hope. Steve's community nominated him for the Discover Eat It Forward program. All I do is win, 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 no matter what. A $25,000 award meant for the most caring and community-minded black-owned restaurants in the country. When you have a shop that's smack dab in the middle of a, of a neighborhood, you immediately become connected with it. Steve has dreams of a special future for his restaurant. Future. We're looking at expansion again. In the next five years, we'd love to be franchising. He hopes that one day his success will send his daughter off to college. A uh, huge thanks to Discover. A uh, huge thank you to the whole city of St. Louis. Hey, big ups to Steve. I love what my people at Discover are doing. You know what? I've got the urge for Steve's hot dog. Hey, big thanks to Steve Ewing and everyone at Steve's Hot Dogs. I just absolutely love that story and it made me hungry. Hey, if you want to find more Eat It Forward winning restaurants near you, head on over to www.eatitforwardterms.com slash winners. You can find all sorts of good folks there. Hey, I want to thank our friends at Discover. Also want to thank Dr. Danielle Moss. And of course, thanks to you for tuning in. Remember, if you are loving this show, there's more goodness here. You can subscribe and hear about the next shows. You definitely can download the podcast and often get the extended conversation. And don't forget, tell a friend. I'll see you soon.